Hello, this is Spellbinder with part two to my last video, which was S510 and S3767 taking vitamins away to steal your life. And this is all about Codex Artemis And this is what it's really all about. Listen, watch, and learn. Now, a bureaucratic shadow called Codex Alimentarius threatens to silence the opposition forever, both here and abroad. But Codex began innocuously enough in 1963 as a creation of two arteries of the United Nations, the Food and Agricultural Organization and the World Health Organization. Back then, nearly everyone endorsed their two major goals, to provide nutritious foods for developing nations, and to shape guidelines for dangerous industrial chemicals in the food supply. Within the past decade, however, Codex Alimentarius has altered its mission dramatically, many say negatively so, to include a wide swathe of products, including dietary supplements and genetically modified organisms. Mr. Scott Tipps began serving as a US delegate to Codex in June of 2000, during the first meetings, he did everything he could to communicate with the head of the U.S. delegation. I, in a flurry of notes, passed comments and suggestions and the like to Elizabeth Yetley, who was the American delegate there, and it made no impact. In fact, the only impact I had was to call her, her during a break and uh, basically be very tough with her about a particular clause that she was trying to remove from the final report. That particular sentence or clause basically said that the United States supports the right of consumers to have free access to vitamins and minerals, and she had unilaterally yanked that from the final reports. This attitude by Ms. Yetley, who is an employee of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, is reflective of Codex meetings in general. In an attempt to shine light on those who are unilaterally making public policy in private, health freedom advocate John Hamill took a small video camera into two Codex meetings in 1998. These grainy videos are all that remain of the tapes, which mysteriously disappeared. Moving on to agenda number five on uh, science and minerals. Can you start that second paragraph? Well, these are draft positions. They're going to draft positions. So they're not, a, not the final word of formal position. We've seen a letter from Ron Paul, and this was signed by Ron Paul, uh, Congressman Stump, and Congressman Cook. We have received a lot of mail. We've been on with it. And you acknowledge that this represents the will of the American people and the will of Congress, correct? There's a wide range of opinions on this one. Despite multiple written requests and the intervention of a U.S. congressman, the FDA refused to answer any questions about codex, dietary supplements, or even labeling for this documentary. But judging from his rare interview with Michael R. Taylor, then Deputy Commissioner for Policy at the FDA, it is apparent that the agency is unaccustomed to meaningful questions about health policy by the media. You stated your concern, and the FDA certainly has on, on mm -hmm. l trip uh, What about your concern regarding something like Prozac, a very well documented 28,000 mm -hmm. adverse reports, uh, uh, 1,600 suicides mm -hmm. associated with that drug. Um, we well, had yeah, drugs that go through our uh, very rigorous uh, testing and, and review process are very well understood chemicals. And drugs are recognized to have both risks and benefits. Uh, that's why they go through a rigorous evaluation. And when those products are put out on the market, we have a good scientific understanding of both the risks and benefits, and that's laid out in very detailed labeling that physicians then use to decide whether to prescribe those products for their patients. Side effects are part of pharmaceuticals. That's recognized, and that's why we're so careful scientifically. There's just no comparison between that situation and what we are dealing with with dietary supplements, which have not been subjected to that kind of study, have not been evaluated by FDA. And a large part of the problem with these supplements is that we simply don't know uh, about their safety. We don't know about their benefits, uh, yet they're being out there marketed uh, for, in some cases, for serious disease-related purposes. There's a big difference. Well, obviously, they, they would say something <coughs> along the lines of that it is the only natural alternative to some of these kinds of, of drugs. And, and 
that's a concern to people that want natural alternatives, right. I suppose. Right. Um, and since the case, the cases against Prozac have been so high, mm -hmm. um, people would question whether or not the health uh, risks of L-tryptophan, again, versus a, a Prozac in right. that kind of usage is uh, judged under the same standards, if you will. Well, okay, I'm sure yeah. what's on the list of things we were going to get into today. Well, he mentioned L-tryptophan, and it just... As the producers try to get an answer from the Deputy Commissioner of the FDA, Mr. Taylor seemed to lose his patience with the tone of the interview. Why don't you turn, turn the camera off, we can talk. You know, I'm happy to talk about this, I don't want to spend the whole morning on it. But of course, Mr. Taylor was anything but happy to discuss the safety record of Prozac versus the amino acid L-tryptophan, which the FDA banned outright when Prozac was approved by the agency. And it is important to note that the Food and Drug Administration has assigned Mr. Taylor's wife, Christine Lewis Taylor, to the World Health Organization, where she is now chairwoman of the Nutrient Risk Assessment Project. I don't think that you can say that anybody at FDA has ever been a friend of dietary supplements. Anybody. They are friends of the, the classical reductionist scientific system that is based on cause and effect and... Uh, doing a bunch of huge and costly studies, which are the backbone of the pharmaceutical industry, which are the which are the driving uh, force of our healthcare system, which is driving us into bankruptcy and killing between 200 and 700,000 people a year. Some of them honestly believe in the useless medication. More, however, are bunkum artists without pity or conscience, willing to risk the lives of fellow human beings to line their own pockets. Institutional hypocrisy and bias are endemic at the agency. In fact, the FDA has made no secret of its intentions to harmonize the U.S. vitamin and mineral standards with Codex, thereby reducing the dosages of common vitamins and minerals to ridiculously low levels. They've said so before Congress, in the National Register, and even on their own website. That system is not a good system, and the dietary supplement guideline, the dietary mineral guideline, mimics the ideas of that system and tries to push them onto the international stage for vitamins and minerals. Bad thinking all the way around. We are at a stage in society when a large number of people, consumers and patients, are waking up to the fact that the healthcare system that they've placed their trust in now for decades is not delivering the healthcare that they need. They're beginning to appreciate that very often if they have major diseases like cancer or heart disease, that the so-called solution to these diseases is in fact killing them. Today, all new drugs must be proved safe and effective before they can be marketed. In other words, the medicine must be safe and must do what's claimed for it. This is why we see this incredible growth in consumer demand for natural products. And of course, just as the consumer is starting to make decisions about what they want to do in healthcare. The regulators have decided with a lot of pressure from big industry sectors to say, you can't have it. It's reserved for us. When the WTO, the World Trade Organization, became a reality in the 1990s, the power of Codex was heightened immeasurably. This new worldwide body, devoted solely to the harmonization of trade standards, gave Codex the enforcement capability that had eluded it for decades. Two U.S. congressmen, a Democrat and a Republican, have a philosophical divide on free trade, but agree completely on the dangers of the WTO and Codex. Now, the WTO is said to be set up for free trade. And I happen to like free trade. I like low tariffs and I like goods and services flowing across borders. Uh, I studied economics in college. I'm a skeptic of the whole theory of free trade, and it really crystallized around uh, the NAFTA and the WTO agreements. I am a champion of national sovereignty, so I do not like the idea of getting involved in what the founders called entangling alliances. So I remember talking uh, to uh, Mickey Cantor, the president's uh, special trade representative, and I'd studied a little bit, and I said, I can't understand how we're going to bind ourselves to this agreement, which has a secret dispute resolution process, uh, which has no rules regarding conflict of interest, and they will essentially preempt U.S. law. And then when you go to the next step of becoming a member of the World Trade Organization, 
means to me that we as a people and as a Congress, uh, we give up too much of our responsibility and our prerogatives. Said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. They can't preempt our laws. I said, oh, you're right. They can just fine us for having our laws and we can pay perpetual fines because we have laws that protect consumers of the environment or we can repeal our laws. But now we're talking about turning over to a world organization that's going to force harmonization. So it's, it's working as designed as far as they're concerned, which is to protect corporate interests and uh, overrule governments and stick it to consumers. And they'll do that under the name of free trade and globalization and pretend that they're on the, on, on the side of, of, of freedom. But actually, they're, they're not. They're, they're on the side of regulations and special interests and protection of uh, certain big corporations. If there's a higher corporate good to be served by breaking the law, by having the FDA uh, you know, uh, work uh, with the, the codex and uh, try and drag the U.S. into this uh, nightmare, then uh, they're all for it and they're doing it. So we do what the WTO tells us, and that's why I'm very leery of the WTO, and I just soon we get out of the WTO. This would be like the ultimate reaching of government uh, into our personal health lives, uh, which would be unbelievable, and, and not even our government, some, you know, bureaucratic, diffuse, uh, multinational, secretive government. It's the power that's in the WTO that we have to deal with ultimately, and I don't like the trend. On Capitol Hill, legislators are now debating the merits of yet another trade agreement called CAFTA the Central American Free Trade Agreement. This latest Trojan horse was wheeled into Washington as a savior for a faltering economy. But as consumers in Europe could confirm, it will only lead to more backroom deals, deals that could spell the end of health freedom as we know it. Now people think that that could never happen here. Uh, probably at one time people in England thought it would never happen there, and yet the, their government has ignored over a million signatures on petitions on this issue saying, sorry guys, we are now a member of the European Union and we must harmonize to European law. If we aren't careful in our hemisphere, the same thing will happen as a result of the free trade area of the Americas. But the trend towards the WTO, NAFTA and now CAFTA being used to harmonize laws and regulations to favor pharmaceutical interests has long been a reality in the European Union. German representatives at Codex began to push the idea of creating safe upper limits on vitamins and minerals. And this was favored in the UK until Dr. Robert Verkirk began orchestrating a precise legal, scientific and public relations strategy to stop it. His organization, the Alliance for Natural Health, brought a landmark legal challenge to the EU Food Supplements Directive. In April 2005, the Advocate General in the European Court declared that the EU directive should be declared invalid under EU law. In July of 2005, UK and European consumers will discover the fate of this legal battle. And it is anything but a sure win. What's coming down the line from code action from Europe is very disturbing. First, you got 450 million people over there. Secondly, they have the most restrictive nutrient access of any of the free world. Third, you just had a woman in France arrested and is now undergoing trial for selling 500 milligrams of vitamin C tablets. So, see, you can't even sell vitamin C tablets over in Europe for some reason, at least back in 2005. And this came out, oh, probably a couple, about four years ago is when this was posted. So, maybe even some time before then. But this was uh, put into operation. It's really sad to see what's going on in the world. That's all I can run of this. I'll have a link to this video. I believe there's a longer one. I'm going to check it, and if it is, I'll have that link there that I'll put it instead as the entire video. It's an hour and a half long. That may be the main video. Now, well, until next time, this is Spellbinder. Be good, be good at it. And have a nice day, and I hope this was educational.